Hi, it's Laurie again. In part two of this tutorial on my Blender to Painter workflow for creating a set of candled game assets, I'll be showing you how to convert an existing orc skin shader from Substance Share into Candle Wax. Now that I've finished modeling all the versions of candles and holders that I'm mapping onto one texture atlas, I've joined them for simplicity in baking. You may notice that I've added some additional edge loops to smooth out the rounded parts of the low poly version, which is a duplicate of my game ready asset that I will only use for baking. As long as the additional edge loops don't change the UVs, this is a handy trick you can use to coax the normals to bake smoother from high to low. Looking at my high poly meshes, you can see they have a subsurf modifier unapplied, and I don't need these UV maps left over from duplicating the low mesh. I've applied distinctly different color materials to my high poly mesh everywhere that I want to assign a different texture in Painter. I'll bake those colors onto a color ID map in just a moment and use it as a mask. At first I had even applied a fourth yellow material to separate the candle wicks, but after running a test bake I realized it would be easier to group the UVs and then fill the polygons with a mask. I left my low poly mesh without any material at all, since that's an unnecessary step when you're setting up an asset to be rendered in an external application, rather than in Blender itself. A single material slot will export with the FBX by default, which is all you'll want on an optimized game asset. Note that my low poly mesh has sharp edges marked with auto smooth set to a high enough angle to round off all the sharp edges that should bake smooth. In contrast, I've cleared all sharps and seams from my high poly mesh and auto smooth is turned off. I'm simply relying on bevels and supporting edge loops to sharpen and smooth the high poly mesh where necessary and letting the subsurf modifier do the heavy lifting. At this point, I can export my bake meshes. File, Export, FBX. I use the same export settings for my game ready assets on my bake meshes out of convenience, but not much is different from the default. I select Only Mesh on the main tab. I don't need to change anything in the Geometry tab. I deselect Add Leaf Bones in the Armature tab, and under Animation I deselect Baked Animation. I've saved all of these as a preset, so now all I have to do is choose my preset from the dropdown, and you can see my forward and up axis settings are tailored to suit our Unreal project. When I name my FBX, you'll see I follow the naming convention I used for the individual meshes in the outliner, with the underscore high suffix. Follow the same process for exporting the low poly bake mesh, renaming it underscore low. There's a handy tooltip at the top of the window reminding me which mesh I had selected in the outliner that I like to refer to to double check my typing. Export that and we can move on to Painter. In Painter, I select File, New, which brings up the window where I choose the low poly mesh I want to bake to. You may have to change some of these settings depending on your project. My target is UE4, so that's fine and the normal map format is DirectX. You can set the document resolution to whatever you like, but I recommend starting small so that you can experiment early on without slowing your system down. It's simple to go back and increase this for baking after you've dialed in all of your textures. With my low poly mesh imported, I can get to work. I like to set up my project to accommodate the additional maps I want to bake. An ambient occlusion map might be useful, and I want to experiment with a transmissive map as well. Without adding these channels to the project, they won't be available in the Properties panel of any material, fill layer, or paint you may want to apply. Next, I'm going to bake my base maps. I start by testing my bake at 1K. In case I need to revise anything, I can do it quickly. Here's where I choose the high poly mesh that I'm going to bake from. Each of these other settings can be adjusted depending on the shape of your mesh, but I don't often need a cage mesh. And the default max frontal and rear distance work just fine in most cases. From experience, I've found that disabling average normals will work better in this situation. This is a setting you'll definitely want to test both ways if your initial bake is unsatisfactory. Match by mesh name comes in handy when your mesh contains parts that are so close in proximity that normal and ambient occlusion bakes overlap. I turn up the anti-aliasing to 4x4, which I believe improves the smoothness of gradients. And under the ID tab, I specify the color source as material color since that's the information I want to use as a mask. There are more adjustments available under these other map tabs, which you should explore if you find that one particular map is not baking as intended. For now though, I'll run a quick test bake and see what happens. I'm satisfied with this bake. I know from earlier tests that some of the normal mapping will be smoother once I do a bake at 4K, but for now, this is good enough to work with. 
It's tempting to bake the 4K right away, but keep in mind that your system will slow down significantly once you start adding more than one material, which can discourage you from experimentation. So don't be too eager to see the finished product just yet. Here's where Painter has assembled all of our base maps, baked from the high poly mesh. A copy of them is also saved in the shelf under the project tab. It's useful to know that if you alter these maps in the shelf, You'll need to manually drag the new version into the texture set to overwrite the bake, but if you rebake them, they will automatically be updated in the texture set. To make a convincing wax texture with the hint of subsurface scattering, I'll need some files from Substance Share. I started by looking for subsurface scattering, an effect that makes it look like light is passing through the surface of an object and illuminating parts of it under the surface as well. We need to enable this shader in Painter before we can use it. So I downloaded the shader here, and then since I know that skin has subsurface properties, and I couldn't find a pre-made material for wax, I searched for skin and found this really neat orc skin shader that is already super close to the effect that I want. Notice how the top lip of the material sample is lighter and less saturated than the rest, getting close to translucent. And the lightly matte, lightly glossy roughness of this material is just perfect for wax. After I've extracted the downloaded files from their zip folders, I locate them in File Explorer and drag and drop each of the extracted files into my project's shelf. For the orc skin, it's the SPM file we want. The import dialog window pops up and it's recognized as a smart material, so I just choose where to import. I imported mine into the shelf for reuse later, so you can see Orc Skin is located here under Smart Materials. It may be confusing that the shader extracts to a folder, but inside are actually two shaders, one with alpha blending that we won't need for candle wax. But you can drag and drop the entire folder into the shelf in Painter, and again it will open up the import window. Again, you decide whether you need this shader for just this project or for future use in the shelf. I've already imported it into my shelf. To use subsurface scattering, we have to enable it under Viewer Settings in this panel. In the middle here, you can see the default shader is PBR Metal Rough. We want to click that and select PBR SSS, not the version with alpha blending. Also under Viewport Settings, we want to enable Transmissive Map. I found out through trial and error that subsurface scattering materials don't display correctly without it. If you recall earlier, I enabled two additional maps in the texture set here, Ambient Occlusion and Transmissive. These weren't really necessary until now, but I sometimes get ahead of myself in setting up my file. This empty layer isn't necessary, so I can delete it and just drag the orc skin material into the layers. If we wanted a blotchy green candle, this would be perfect. Tapping C, I can cycle through the separate texture channels where I want to take a look at my transmissive. If I expand the material folder, I can drill down into its components. When I don't know what I'm seeing, I click on the sublayers, enabling transmissive to see if it will have an effect. It looks like I could use this base shadows layer to block out some of the transmissive map deep in the core of the candles, so I'll leave that enabled. Checking through the other maps, I develop a plan. These skin detail layers aren't contributing to the translucent look I need. I'll add a new fill layer to the stack and turn off all the maps except the transmissive map, so that's all this layer contributes. When I change this fill to white, my transmissive map starts to look useful. Now we can get rid of these skin detail layers, which are just giving it the noisy, bumpy look of skin. And that is the smooth, uniform wax consistency that I was looking for. This part required a little experimenting to get the colors just the way I want. Something in this stack is contributing a lot of redness, so I try reducing the saturation of the base highlight layer, but it doesn't help. Still, that's closer. Now I adjust the base shadows layer, and when that doesn't cut the redness, I just keep poking around. 
As you can see, I wasn't able to diagnose the exact cause of the red tint, but I was able to tone it down by turning off the ambient occlusion layer. Happy with the end result, but not wanting to leave the mystery unsolved, I dug even further and found that the surface highlight color can be adjusted in the shader settings here under Subdermal Color. Whenever I'm diagnosing an issue like this, I use contrasting colors to make it easier to spot what effect the adjustments are having. In the end, I discovered plenty of variations, but no way to change the underlying hue. Tinkering with the level's effect input minimum on the layer labeled SSS permanently turned the layer grayscale. That wasn't particularly useful for this effect, but maybe handy knowledge in another project. Now I can finish up my candle holders, which I'll begin by isolating the wax material to just the candles. I like to name my layers as I go because once you have four or five different materials and all their sublayers, it can be many times harder to make adjustments. Right click the layer you want to mask and add a mask with color selection. Click the pick color button and your baked color ID mask is displayed for you to choose from. First, I want to add a proper string material to my wicks. I've also downloaded this fabric material from Substance Share, so I'll drag it into my layers. I've also downloaded this fabric material from Substance Share, and I'll drag that into my layers. I shrink the UV scale, and adjust the UV rotation so it aligns with the UVs. As I mentioned before, I could have assigned a separate color ID to these, but if you group your UV islands intentionally, you can also use this approach. Right click the layer and this time choose Add Black Mask. Then we'll pick the Polygon Fill tool and draw a box selection around the UV islands. I want the wicks to look a little burnt, so I'm going to add another fill layer, this time deselecting all but color. These details are so small that they don't need an elaborate set of maps, but I'll add roughness for good measure and I pick a color that will do the trick. I add another black mask, and then I choose a grungy brush set to white. Scale it down a bit with right bracket and increase hardness in the properties. Brush some burn marks onto just the tips. This is easy in the texture viewport, but you may want to go back and touch up the seams and mist spots in the 3D view. Now I can add materials to my candle holders. I won't go into great detail about my process here, but I'm basically adding a material that has some of the properties that I want in the final product. I'm tweaking that base material and then layering on additional materials for dirt, wear, and tear. Here I'm adding a simple color fill to demonstrate, but you'll generally want to use materials that are similar to the base, but adjusted in some slight way to be darker, or faded, or rougher or smoother instead. Then I use a smart mask to reveal the grunge layer only in targeted areas. 
Smart masks use all of those additional maps that we baked at the beginning of the tutorial, like world space normals, curvature, and thickness. They target specific areas of the mesh. To mask away the effects of a masked layer, you can add a folder and then drag your masked layer inside. With your layer in a folder, you can add an additional mask to all of the contents, which I'll use to isolate the grunge to the metallic candle holder here. To access the settings on the first mask, right-click on the mask icon and dig into the settings from there. This particular mask is constructed with two layers. The top layer is a grunge, which you can customize by selecting another texture and adjusting the settings if you select a procedural. The second mask layer has a number of other settings depending on which baked map you want to influence the result. Adjustments to the curvature selection are based off the curvature map and so forth. Now that I'm satisfied with my material, I'll begin the process of exporting textures for use on the final game asset in Unreal. Please join me for the final tutorial in this series, where I'll export these textures and walk you through two options. Using the translucent map, I'll create one material with Unreal's subsurface scattering and one that fakes subsurface with an emissive. Thank you for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments below and feel free to ask us questions. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this one from the Timefire VR team. Thank <laughs> you.